a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we share together from Proverbs 15 verse 13. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. The attitude of our heart shows on our faces, he's saying. And if our heart is light and happy, then our appearance will be light and happy. But if there is distress in our heart, sorrow, despair, then we will appear sad. By sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And sorrow and joy are contagious. So if one person is sad, Others can be sad around them. And if one person has joy in their heart, then others will be encouraged. This is also talking about depression, sadness and sorrow, making it difficult for a person to get on with life because he's just thinking it is not worthwhile. There is sorrow and sadness. The gospel has come that we might have hope in our life. We all experience a range of circumstances, but our circumstances should not dictate our feelings. Rather, the Gospel tells us that we can learn to be content in whatever circumstances we are in, because our hope is in the living God. When Paul spoke about the armour of the believer, he talked about the helmet of salvation. And in Thessalonians, it was the helmet of the hope of salvation. For it is the anticipation of the future that gives us hope, so that the present circumstances do not overwhelm us. If we know that there is a God who is over all, and that he has given us very great promises which we rely upon, then we can have a merry heart because our sins are forgiven and that can lead to a positive outlook on life, a cheerful countenance. But if we do not have that hope, then circumstances will overwhelm us. By sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. David had been a very successful military leader, captain in Saul's army, so much so that Saul grew jealous of him and sought to kill him. So David had gone with his band of men to Philistine territory and been given a village there, Ziklag. Then when the Philistines sought to fight against King Saul, the king of Gath told David to come with him. And so David lined up with the Philistines against Saul. But the other kings of the Philistines said, No way, this is David there would be no better opportunity for him to turn back to Saul than if he's in the middle of our army. Send him home. When David got back to Ziklag, they found the Amalekites had raided the town, burnt it with fire, taken all the people and goods away. David was distraught. His men blamed him and were going to kill him. How did he respond? We're told he strengthened himself in the Lord. He went and got his harp and he started singing the songs that he had taught himself as a young man, singing the songs of praise and dependence of God. And when he had lifted his spirits, then he asked the Lord, What do I do? And the Lord said, Go and recover everything, which he did. He changed his countenance by focusing on the hope of his God. I'm reminded of the words of Hebrews chapter 12. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily it snares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus ran the race, the course that was laid out before him, despising the shame of the cross, 
enduring the agonies of the cross and has entered into the Father's presence, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And he is the example for us. The context of this verse, of course, is the previous chapter 11 of Hebrews, which demonstrates the hope of the believer in the lives of so many of the Old Testament saints. And it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Faith is believing what God says. And so we look forward to that day when God's word will be fulfilled. The evidence on which faith is based is history. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And the more we understand the nature of our universe, the more we see that the things that are were made of things that are not visible. Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared, something that has mass, uh, we can see. But E is energy, which you can't see. And the speed of light is something you can't see. So everything that exists is based on something that is not visible. He goes on to say, without faith it's impossible to please God, because he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Why do I bother getting up to read the scriptures every day? Why do I talk to the Lord if he is not there? Well, he is there, and this creation demonstrates that he is there, because It is a most incredible creation, evidently designed to the nth degree. And life, if we could assemble all the atoms in the right order to construct a body, would it automatically have life? It wouldn't automatically have life. Where does life come from? Life has come from God. And so we are called upon to have faith in God. But God cannot be seen because he is the maker of all things. He is not part of this creation. He is the source of this creation. But he has made this creation and he has created us so that we might know him and be known by him. And so we have the examples of Abel offering a better sacrifice than Cain because he recognised God. Enoch walking with God, although he couldn't see him, and being taken by God. Noah building an ark, because God told him the flood was coming. Abraham leaving the city he was in, Ur, which was subsequently destroyed, to come to a land that God showed him and promised to give to his descendants. Now the promises made to these people were not fulfilled in their lifetime. But they believed them and they looked forward to their fulfilment in the new heavens and new earth. And this is how we can have joy in our heart. For the joy that was set before him, the Lord Jesus endured the cross. The epistle of Paul that speaks most about joy is the one in which he was in the most miserable of circumstances the letter to the Philippians. And in it it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Rejoicing is not in the circumstances of our life. The rejoicing is in the Lord, who raises the dead. So we have the promise of resurrection that we look forward to. Going back to our proverb then, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Many people in this society are depressed and depression stops them achieving their potential. The answer to depression is faith in God who has given us many very great and precious promises. And so our heart can be fixed on the Lord and our countenance can be cheerful because our hope is in God.